Um, welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Emily Baranowski. For those of you who do not know me, uh, I am Phi Alpha Delta's Deputy Director, the primary contact for Law Chapter Operations here in the Executive Office, and I am one of the eight staff members that work here full-time in the office to help uh, all of you guys out and prepare for your chapter operations. Uh, my contact information and the Executive Office contact information is here on the title screen, um, and we'll have it on our final slide as well so that you can get in touch with us for anything you need. Again, I will say it one last reminder, the session is being recorded. So if you're not able to stay for the whole time, or if you have other members who would like to see this content, we do hope to have it posted on the Law Officer Resources page um, sometime by the end of next week. We've got about an hour scheduled for today's presentation. I've got a few core topics that I'm gonna go through, um, and then I'm gonna move on to specific questions uh, from you all, some of which were submitted in advance, and the others that we are, can definitely take via the chat. So here are those main topics we're gonna start on today. Um, if you know you have any questions as we go through this, please don't feel that you need to wait um, until the end for the question and answer period. Please go ahead and use the chat feature to submit any questions to me. I will make sure that I read them aloud so that everyone can hear them if they don't have the chat pulled up on their phone or their laptop. Um, so the main topics we're gonna go over today are recruitment, chapter events and programming, and looking ahead to the spring, part of that will also include the resources and policies that we have available for you all. This um, is just meant to be an overview today. Like I said, we only have an hour and I could talk for three days about all this stuff. Um, so please don't be afraid to ask questions, schedule a follow up call with me, um, or, you know, let me know anything else you need. With all that being said, let's go ahead and crack into our first slide. Um, so I'm going to start today by just doing a quick review of the major dates, deadlines, and fees for uh, the year. If you all are current officers, which almost all of you are, um, you would have been emailed me emailed all of these and they are on our website, uh, but I want to make sure that we always start off any presentation by making sure you have the critical dates and information that is important to you. Uh, so the first date I want to point out here on this list is October 3rd. Registration for our annual law school mock trial competition will open on October 3rd. Participation is open to all law school chapters, and you'll see farther down the list here that that competition itself is being held February 23rd through 25th, 2023 in Arlington, Virginia. It will be a fully in-person event. Next date to know on this list is November 8th, and there's two things going on on November 8th. First of all, Founders Day, Phi Alpha Delta Founders Day is uh, that day, November 8th. Uh, it's also the day that we uh, ask that you all submit your programming calendars for the spring 2023 semester. So that's a big date to know. Um, in addition to having some events around Founders Day, we're actually going to be doing a full Founders Week based celebration, some virtual events to honor our founders to support our international foundation. Um, our next virtual national initiation ceremony will be held that week. So keep an eye on your email because we are finalizing the schedule for that now. The next date you're going to see here on the list, and I know it's crazy to think about spring 2023 already when it's barely August, uh, September 2022. Um, but important date to know is that February 15th is the deadline for chapters to hold elections. Uh, we know it's not always possible for you guys to hit this date exactly because uh, it is pretty early in the semester. Uh, but we ask that you just aim as close as possible. Uh, we ask chapters to hold elections this early for a few reasons. Uh, one, many chapter officers in PAD are 3Ls, and we want to make sure that those 3Ls have the appropriate amount of time to prepare for finals and the bar exam and not focus on election stuff. Um, two, we want the incoming officers to have as much time as possible to transition into their roles with the help of those outgoing officers. Uh, newly elected officers don't actually have to take over right away in February. They can take over in April, which is the next date we'll talk about there. Um, so, and then three, if there are problems with elections, whether it is a lack of candidates, if there's a contentious election, scheduling those elections early allows you to actually address those issues as you go, uh, rather than having an issue where suddenly everyone's off campus and you're no longer able to do anything because it's summertime. <laughs> no one wants to do that during final season either. So, um, 
please ensure that once elections are held, they're reported to our office as soon as possible, even if the officers have not officially taken over yet. We just need time to update our record. So the earlier that we know, the better. There's a submission form on our site for that, or you can email me directly at emily at pad.org. Uh, we already talked about mock trials, so I'll skip that and go to April 15th there, which, uh, as I briefly mentioned before, that is the deadline for the chapter's officer transition process to be complete. So if you've held elections in February and you want to give your new officers time to get acclimated, April 15th is when we consider them have taking over officially for the new officers. Uh, so during this transition process, the incoming and outgoing officers should work to create together to create the fall 2023 calendars. So calendars are due on that date as well. During that February 15 to April 15 period is also when your district justices, if your district has one, will be hosting the district leadership and transition conferences. This is a mandatory district based event for the incoming and outgoing officers to get everyone together and go over those critical transition processes. So if you're looking at this thinking, wow, this is already overwhelming, don't worry, we are here to help. That's exactly what those conferences do for you. Plus, it gives you a really great opportunity to network with other members from your district, uh, both law students and alumni. Uh, next up on the list is June 5th when award applications are due. I think that's pretty uh, straightforward, but they are a great idea But because uh, they help us recognize your chapter for all your hard work. Um, and the final date on this list is even farther in the distance. Uh, some of you, I'm recognizing some names here on the participant list, were actually just with us for our 64th biennial convention in Scottsdale, Arizona. The next convention will not be for another two years in August 2024. So we don't have a location or precise dates yet, but I always want to make sure that we uh, talk about that nice and far in advance, because even though some of you may not be attending a convention as officers, it's still your responsibility to ensure that the chapter is prepared to attend convention in two years time. So on to fees, uh, just a quick reminder, uh, a lot of you know, I'm sure that the new member uh, initiation fee is $90. This is a one-time membership fee owed to our office. You pay it once and you are a PAD member for life. The only other uh, fees that we charge when you graduate are voluntary alumni dues. So you don't have to pay anything else if you want to maintain your membership after law school. If you're a new member who hate, uh, is coming from a pre-law chapter, we actually do reduce that fee down to $70 because you paid a, a pre-law fee as well. So that's the two fees to know. Um, and it's important to know that there are no fees at all if a member is transferring from another law school chapter. I am blowing through the, some of this fees and date stuff pretty quickly, but that's because hopefully you guys all got some of the emails from our office that have gone out in the last few weeks with this information. So this is pretty much just a review. Uh, I do want to make a note with the fees there. Uh, one of the biggest questions that we get asked in the office is if we waive our membership fees. Um, and we don't uh, because Phi Alpha Delta is a nonprofit and those initiation fees are necessary for us to operate. Uh, the fee covers individual initiation materials, chapter insurance, and it allows us to continue to provide free recruitment materials, event materials, free webinars and content, member benefits, things like that. Um, I think it's important to note for recruitment purposes that a $90 fee for a lifetime membership is pretty good. Um, and we really hate raising our fees, so we don't intend to do that anytime soon. We do offer payment plans. Um, if anyone would like to do a payment plan, they are very flexible. And we also encourage that if chapters would like to do any fundraising uh, to either waive fees on their end for uh, new members joining or provide need-based assistance, that is always a great idea as well. Moving right along here, I know one of the biggest things you guys are all thinking about right now is recruitment because school is starting. You have a lot going on. There's a whole new batch of 1Ls coming in for you guys to work with and recruit. Uh, fall is definitely, I think, the easiest time to recruit, but uh, don't expect that it means that everyone is just going to come to you. Active recruiting is the most effective option for recruitment. Um, when you are recruiting, 
you want to consider what got you to join Phi Alpha Delta. Was it a specific program that your chapter was offering? Is it something on the national side, like the mock trial competition? Um, maybe it was one of our member benefits, like the discounts you get through Kaplan. Um, or it's entirely possible that it was just someone walking up to you and saying, hey, would you like to join this organization I'm a part of? It, just because it's a simple approach doesn't mean it's wrong. <laughs> I think that, you know, you don't overthink recruitment. And like I just said, simplest approach is to just ask people if they want to join, see what they are interested in. And remember that they, you are faced with a really great opportunity to introduce a whole new group of people to Phi Alpha Delta for the very first time. Um, there's some five key elements of recruiting here, and I've listed them out here on the side, and I'll go through them pretty quickly here. Um, the foundation or the identity is the first one to know about. Um, a potential new member is going to ask you to explain what Phi Alpha Delta is and why they should join. You need to have an answer to that. That should be a general overview of what Phi Alpha Delta is as an organization. We're the oldest legal fraternity in the country with over 330,000 members, including some current Supreme Court justices and former presidents. Uh, and then what are you on a local level as well? We are the, I always say Towson chapter because our office is based in Towson as an example. Uh, we are the Towson chapter. We do a lot of really great professional development and academic programming events. Plus we're all really close as a chapter so we're looking forward to building our network. That is a great answer about what Phi Alpha Delta does and what we stand for. The next item here is the buy-in or the hook. Um, you need to find out what people are interested in getting out of their membership. If someone is given a task to do um, or feels like they're being heard, they have ownership over a process, they are way more likely to actually follow through with their membership, to uh, become more engaged in chapter leadership, potentially be a chapter leader down the line. So you may want to consider setting something up for the new class of members, whether it's a, um, a 1L committee, a new member committee that you can have very interested new members join so that they feel like they have a say in chapter operations and they're actually getting invested in the chapter right when they walk in and you don't have to convince them in a in six months, in a year, that they should step up and do something else for the chapter. The next item here is what we call the handshake or the connection. Um, in some of these ongoing COVID times, you can swap out handshake for fist bump or elbow bump. That's fine. We're flexible. Uh, but find something uh, to help connect the dots and learn more about the individual interests. If you've gotten them to buy in on the chapter as a whole, find out what they want specifically and build the relationship with the organization through your current members. Recruitment should never just be something that your executive board does. It should be a full chapter effort. People join organizations because they want to be involved with the people that they see. So don't discount yourselves as your biggest recruiting tools. Um, they also want to make sure that they can get something out of their membership. We all want that. You know, they want to know what their $90 is going to. So make sure that you have a list of the member benefits of your chapter's events, all those things that can make them say, yes, this is worth me joining this organization. The next item is not so much something to do, but something not to do. Um, it's getting rid of the barrier. And here, I'll remove myself a little bit here so that I am no longer covering this screen. There we go. Um, so the, <laughs> avoid the barrier. Um, get out from behind your recruitment table if you have an actual table. If you are reaching out to potential new members, uh, you know, via email, social media, that's fine. But the number one most effective method is always going to be face-to-face -face communication. This is a standard of recruiting in any kind of function. Um, so just being present at other, uh, other organizations events, at school events, all that kind of stuff, that is what is going to get you that real membership connection. I think we can all talk about how much the virtual environment has impacted us over the last few years. Um, and for those of you who were at convention, you can see uh, really what it's like being in the room with everyone and how different that is. For me, just being here on a Zoom screen, showing you a PowerPoint about recruitment versus how you feel about um, actually talking to people in the room. 
Um, the final option, which is, or not option, uh, but item on this list is actually the most commonly forgotten one. Um, and that's the ask or the close, because so many people forget to actually ask the question, would you like to join Phi Alpha Delta? Or can we get you signed up for PAD? What do we need to do to get you in, uh, joining our chapter? It's crazy how many people we speak to who say that the reason they joined this organization is just simply because someone asked them. And that is sometimes one of the biggest things that people miss. And that's why you're not, you know, finishing the recruitment process. And, you know, you may have a great recruitment table, but if those are not equating to people actually signing up, you may have forgotten that last critical step. <laughs> Um, recruiting should definitely be happening all the time, but please take advantage of time at the 1L orientation, organization fair, like I mentioned before, other events set up by the school, whether it's homecoming, something like that, um, to always have recruiting out and uh, have materials, have links. It's so easy to share links these days, and that's such an effective way to get the information out there. Um, don't forget about your non-1L students. I know they are the easiest ones to recruit, but that doesn't mean that you should be forgetting about the 2Ls, the 3Ls, the part-time students, the non-traditional students, and even your faculty members. They can all join PAD at any time. We have a very broad open membership policy, and that's because we want to be as inclusive as possible for these groups. And forgetting about those groups really does limit your recruitment options. Um, something in particular that I want to point out is that faculty members can join for free. So if you want to get faculty members signed up in part of your chapter, please just get in touch with us. We'll make sure that happens for them and they don't have to pay to maintain their membership. Uh, when you are starting recruitment, you should already have an idea of when your next initiation ceremony will be. I usually suggest that you plan your first ceremony within the first six weeks of classes starting. That way you are getting all of those members who joined at orientation, organization fair, etc. You're getting them in and officially initiated into PAD. Uh, but then you can hold smaller initiation ceremonies later in the semester if you have more people join. Um, that's always a great idea. You can combine it with a chapter event, a social, a meeting, something Thing like that. Um, and that way people still feel like it's an exciting event, but you don't ne necessarily need to do the full ritual after that first big ceremony. When you're setting up initiation ceremonies, the Law Chapter Ritual Handbook, which is on our website, details everything that you're going to need for setting up an initiation ceremony. It has a list of what you might want to have at the ceremony, like actual materials. Um, it has a diagram for how to set up rooms and tables, and it has a full script for the initiation ceremony. So all you all really need to do as members or chapter officers is gather those materials and then have the officers show up to read those parts. Although it is a long ceremony, so I highly suggest you do a run through or rehearsal first, just to make sure that you get all of the important content in there. One of the specific questions that was asked um, in advance of this session was how to get some of the ritual materials. I know that's something that a lot of you are facing right now because you know, you, maybe you haven't been on campus in a few years, maybe uh, when everyone left campus in spring 2020, someone might have taken things with them and not brought them back. Um, so that's one of the big questions we're getting right now is about um, ritual materials, general chapter materials, things like that. And I'll go over it in more detail later. But um, the ritual items that you'll want to basically make sure you have are things like a listing of initiates and initiation materials, decorative items like purple and gold tablecloths and candles, and ceremonial items like robes. I want to point out none of these are required. You will not be you know, marked as having an incomplete initiation if you don't have those items. They are just items that help add to the ritualistic element of the initiation. Um, for things like decor, craft stores, Amazon, you know, any kind of online you know, shopping center, that's going to be your number one go to for things like that. I know personally, I have a box of virtual materials here in my office that I use, and I got really great um, battery operated gold candles from Amazon that are fantastic. I use them all the time when we need to do initiation stuff. Um, things like the logistical items, the listing of initiates, the initiation materials, all that stuff can come from our office. And I'll tell you later how to request them from us. We've got a really handy form online. We can do all of that stuff for you. They are free included in your uh, membership fee. Um, and then the ceremonial items, things like robes, those are things you can acquire over time. 
usually people end up acquiring robes as um, they're actually, people will end up donating their uh, graduation robes back to the chapter. That's a really great way to do it because it usually also has your school logo on it in some capacity. Um, so if you're able to do that, that's great. Uh, but we don't discount the idea of going to, uh, you know, Spirit Halloween and finding their costume judicial robes. They actually work really well. And I know we're about to hit Halloween season, so keep an eye on those sales. <laughs> So they don't have to be official judicial robes, but that's a great idea. Uh, you may also want to consider if you have any contacts with local courts, um, actually getting in touch with them to solicit donations. It's possible that there are old judges robes that they don't that they're not using, um, but they're definitely not as readily available as they once were. So don't go too crazy trying to get a hold of things. If you can't have robes, professional dress is just fine. It's what a lot of people choose to do these days. All right. Moving on to our next section. Um, so when we're talking about recruitment, one of the biggest tools in your arsenal is your chapter's event calendar. People want to join organizations that are doing things. It's as simple as that. Even if you're just starting out and you're and you're doing this for the first time, there are options that you have available to you um, based on our events, things like that, um, that you can definitely take advantage of what we're offering. Uh, we went over deadlines earlier, so hopefully you guys all know that the fall programming calendars for this semester were due in April. Hopefully your chapter has that finished. If you have not, make that a priority to sit down as a board. Do that now as the semester is starting. It will take so much work off of you to just get it scheduled, done, out of the way, and that way you're not planning as things get really crazy with school. We understand things will need to change. Nothing is ever set in stone, and we encourage flexibility, but having an idea of when your events are going to be held now is really going to benefit you in the long run. All of our programming categories are listed here. I think I'm pointing in the right direction <laughs> on the side. Um, so I, I won't go into those with a lot of great detail because they are also listed out in the operations guide with a little bit more detail. Um, we also have some really great programming examples in the operations guide as well. So please use those ideas. Uh, please ask us for ideas if you need help. Um, we can even provide past calendars from your chapter. That's one of the reasons we collect those um, not only to help you guys out but also for you know longevity of uh, chapter materials so if your chapter is trying to get back into stuff after maybe a rough couple of years and you want to know what they used to do on campus let us know we can help you Generally, we have some advice about setting up events. Um, one, I always suggest that you work with other organizations on campus, other uh, campus offices like career services to co-sponsor events and share resources. Um, I think that it, you know, you're limiting yourself if you try to make every event something that just PAD is doing. Uh, you, you can be a member of Phi Alpha Delta and any other organization except another law fraternity of which there's only a handful out there. So, you know, you want to get in touch with the Environmental Law Society and schedule a community service event, that's a great idea. Have them come in and talk to your chapter. Utilize those resources. Use those on-campus offices. I already mentioned career services, alumni departments on campus. Uh, your school, let me tell you, is very invested in making sure that you as students remain connected as alumni. So those offices usually have a pretty decent amount of budgets to put on events and programs. And you can go to them and say, hey, we need help. We want to bring alumni back to campus, something like that. And th they will be able to help you out. They law schools, all schools really, really do invest in that kind of alumni programming. So don't overlook that option. Uh, I know also, you know, we've got a lot of uh, programming categories listed here, just because there's all of these, you know, checkbox of two per semester, one per semester, it doesn't mean you can't double up on some of these categories. Um, you know, if you do, uh, you bring a couple alumni to your chapter to do some kind of panel, that's not only an alumni event, but I think that's a professional event as well. So make sure that you get creative with these. And if you're looking at this and saying, there's no way we can hold that many events, then figure out a system that works for you while still also hitting these categories. 
Uh, I think one of the biggest things you can do as a chapter to build your brand on campus is to create an event that you hold every semester or every year. This is something that, you know, during that officer transition process, you would talk to the incoming officers about, make sure they know all the work that you put in, get the information from past officers, create a signature event that your chapter is going to be known for, because that's the kind of thing that will build the institutional memory of PAD on your campus. So that's that's a really, really big thing to do. Um, I also think that, you know, people forget that we have a massive library on our YouTube channel of events that we've put on, particularly virtual events that we've done in the last two years. The Phi Alpha Delta Speaker Series, the um, any of our uh, partner content, that is all on there. You guys are more than welcome to use those recordings. They're for you guys, they're a member benefit. You can show them to chapter members um, and have a discussion about it afterwards. Or if you're on there and there's a speaker you really like and you want to be connected with, send me an email. I can let you know, hey, yeah, that person from the speaker series would be happy to do a session with your chapter. Um, in that same vein, you know, definitely, I, I know we're not all thrilled with any kind of virtual. I know it's, it is rough. It's kind of, it feels like a someone speaking at you instead of speaking with you still. Um, but working with virtual, particularly when it comes to working with alumni, is still an incredibly viable option. Um, it is so much easier these days to get a group of alumni from all over the country on a Zoom meeting um, where they can talk to your chapter members and really share their experiences in a way that, you know, they would not be able to maybe physically fly down to your chapter wherever you happen to be. So if, you know, you're a chapter in Louisiana and you want an attorney from California, we can do that now. Um, so that's a really exciting opportunity. I always say in this day and age, have some virtual backup plans just in case we never know what the next fun thing is going to be. And we also need to acknowledge that in this time, uh, people expect virtual elements to their membership. Um, so I always think a mix of uh, virtual and in person is a great idea. Um, but, you know, that's something that you guys can all decide as a chapter. I do always strongly suggest with any kind of event, particularly events involving alumni, that you guys plan early and you uh, notify both your members and your panelists as early as possible. Alumni in particular, you know, a couple days, a couple weeks notice usually isn't going to work for them. They need like at least a month and a half to two months. So that's another critical element to planning your calendar early before the semester begins so that you can appropriately contact those members, make sure that they're available, get everything set up so that they can fit it into their professional calendars and their personal calendars. Uh, does anyone have any questions about events before we move on to our next section? Yes, I would like to know. Hi. Um, um, hi. Hey. <laughs> um, I would like to know if, if we wanted um, Dr. Tyner from convention to come speak. Is that like an option for yeah. us? Absolutely. Um, that's a great example. Thank you. Um, yeah, any speaker that we've had at a PAD event, we are always happy to make an introduction for your chapter. Um, we Sometimes we can't make any promises when it comes to keynotes, and we'll always be upfront with you if this is a speaker that we paid for, and therefore there might be a fee involved with their um, speaking. But uh, Dr. Tyner is a really great example. For those who don't know, she was one of our keynote speakers at convention um, and very well received, I think. Um, so yes, send me an email. I'll connect you guys um, because she has definitely expressed interest in working with other chapters. Um, it doesn't matter if it's a small chapter event or a large event like convention, she's on board. So yeah, we can do that for you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Of course, that's a great note too. Um, I mean, I know I already mentioned, you know, if you see a pad speaker that you want to get connected with, let us know. But we can also connect you with uh, whether it's local alumni, alumni that may not be local, but work in specific field. Um, those are the kind of things that our office facilitates those connections with. You don't necessarily um, just have to go off of who you know. We'll help you make those connections if you let us know who you want to talk to, you know, generally speaking, um, topics and, and things like that. 
Um, the other thing to know uh, with our programming too that I wanted to mention before we move on is a lot of our PAD partners will put on events for you all. Um, you guys will actually be receiving, uh, chapter officers will be receiving an email in the next few weeks about a few of our Phi Alpha Delta partners who are willing to put on events for free, usually virtually for the chapters. Um, so that is a great thing to keep in mind too. All right. Um, Megan, I see your question. Do you have any advice in situations where your school has denied funding for events, like trying to bring in a dinner for initiation or food for a final study session? Yes, I do. Um, there's a few things I want to mention with that. One, if you are looking for funding for a professional development, academic, networking, service-based event, we actually do have funding that you can apply for through our foundation. I'm actually going to mention that a little bit later too, um, that will assist you in some of that funding. So one, apply for funding through us and we can help you out with some of that stuff. Um, the second piece of advice, if your school is denied funding for something, you know, like you just said, dinner or, you know, pizza at a study session, something that's a little bit more simple, that is a great opportunity to work with one of our partners in exchange for them, maybe sending you some flyers to put out at that event. They could also maybe provide some funding um, and make sure that that is going, you know, that, that that's going out and stuff. Um, oh, Jen, I just saw your, your notes. Me, but yeah, inspiration fund. That's exactly what I was talking about with applying for the foundation. And we will talk more about that later. Um, so, yeah, reach out to our partners, use the PAD Inspiration Fund, and then consider doing local fundraising to assist with that as well. Um, that can be a local chapter dues system. That can just be a, a voluntary donor system. System. You can reach out to your alumni. We can provide a chapter alumni list and you can be honest with them and say, hi, our chapter is looking to build up our events and we've been denied funding. Can you help? Uh, we can help you with templates for that. Uh, we you know, always reach out to our office to ask how we can connect you to people who might be able to help because honestly, alumni nine times out of 10 are willing to help out your chapter. And I think sometimes people forget that reaching out and asking is sometimes the most simple way to do it. So yeah, that fundraising, um, oh, Imani, that's a great 10% fundraiser. That's great. Yeah, those kind of fundraisers are so simple um, where you get a, a share of profits um, based on off of a fundraiser. So that's a great idea. Thank you. Um, let's see, Cortland, I saw your question. Are there any flyers or posters and templates that can be used for recruitment and advertising? Yes, there are. We have some links, and I'm going to go ahead and start actually sharing links through the chat here. Uh, we have a whole bunch of virtual recruitment resources that you all can use. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put that in here for you. Um, that does have some social media templates, some general flyers. If there's anything on here that you know you're like this is great but we need it to be a little bit different let us know we're happy to help you out um there's also a great way to get um you know chapter rosters all that kind of stuff um juliana is there a way i can get a chapter specific alumni list yes we have all of that information here in our office and we can share a basic contact list with you please just send me an email and we will uh, as soon as we can we'll get a full list back to you um, yeah, sometimes even though there are some schools that pour quite a bit of money into their alumni networks, not all of them are as accurate as possible. We are happy to share what information that we have with you all. Great. All right. Great questions, guys. Great questions. All right, we're about halfway through our time, so I'm actually starting to wind down in my presentation part of things so we can get to more of your questions and any discussion. Um, so the big, the last big thing that I want to talk about in terms of our topics is looking ahead. I don't want to set like stress anyone out by already thinking about the spring semester, um, but I, as I've been reiterating over and over again, the more that you plan ahead, the easier your life will be in the future. <laughs> So um, I, I put this slide in here so that you are starting to think about things like elections and transitions. Um, being in a leadership position, honestly, that means more than just planning for the week or the month ahead. It means you're seeing the big picture, and that is a really great skill to have that we're hoping that we can help you develop. So again, I've already pointed out February 15th is the deadline to hold elections. April 15th is the deadline to complete officer transitions. And sometime in the middle of that block, your district leadership and transition conferences will be held. And they should be taken into account when you're planning your events for your spring. Candidates for office should know that they are expected to attend. 
Um, the responsibility of educating the next group of leaders is on the current leadership. So it's also on all of us. So that's what our office is here for. That's what our volunteers are here for. Um, but remember that you as chapter officers are really the only ones who can answer specific questions about your chapter and your school, things that I might not know, things that your district justice might not know. Um, I would definitely suggest um, for many of you who are just starting out the school year as new officers, keep a list of questions and things that you've had to figure out as you are starting. And, and keep the answers to those questions and turn that over to the new board. If you can help them out in any way, it's only going to make your chapter stronger in the long run. Um, the, like I said, I, I sound like a broken record. The earlier you plan, the easier your life will be. So that is my biggest advice. Establish an election plan early, consult your chapter's bylaws. If you don't have bylaws, use our model bylaws document. Um, you may want to consider setting up a shared file system like a Google Drive to save all chapter files. I know that was one of the specific questions that was asked before this session is if we have any advice on shared file systems. Personally, I like Google Drive. I know some uh, schools have um, systems like a twin system or other school portals that will allow you to do that. Um, uh, there's nothing against a physical binder with every all the materials there or, you know, flash drive with that information. Uh, you may prefer, you know, an iCloud drive if everyone uses Apple products. You may prefer a Discord server. We don't have any rules about that. Um, it's only it's all about what works best for you all. Um, I've already mentioned the district leadership and transition conferences. They are, of course, very important. And then when it comes to actually setting up elections, I suggest you know you advertise the positions and expectations early so that you know so that everyone's aware of the open positions. Um, give candidates a platform to share their ideas. Um, if you're worried about turnout for an in-person election, consider online elections and polling instead. That's perfectly allowable. And then again, um, as I mentioned before, please report those results to your school and our office as soon as possible so that everyone can get their uh, information updated. All right. Um, during that officer transition process, I'll say it again, you should be reminding the new board that they should be planning for the 2024 convention. I know, you know, with every two, with it only being every two years, sometimes that gets missed. And our goal is to make sure that that doesn't get missed for you all as you go into the next two years. Any questions about looking ahead? Uh, there will be Trust me, plenty of time as we get into um, the rest of the fall for us to share resources. And we do plan to hold another session like this, the beginning of the spring semester that will pretty much purely be focused on elections and transition. So it's more of a think about it now, but you don't have to have everything finalized just yet. Okay, great. All right, let me move myself out of the way again here. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> um, before we move on to answering some more of those specific questions, um, I want to make sure that you're aware of the resources that we have that can help your chapter reach some of these requirements and goals. Um, there's a lot of important things to know as a leader of your chapter, and these are the key things here on this slide that you'll want to know about. Um, so first, some place to find the important file for Delta policies is going to be on our resources and policies page, which I'm going to share the link for in just a moment here via the Zoom chat. Our primary governing document is the file for Delta fraternity policy manual. It lists out things like uh, financial policies for chapters, social media policies, our membership policies. Um, so if you ever have any questions on things like that, the policy manual is a great place to start. Um, as officers, you know, you guys also, and as an in a position of leadership, you, you guys have a responsibility to report any incidents or policy violations that may be brought to your attention in the course of PAD chapter operations. We sincerely hope you will never ever have to use it, but on that resources and policies page, you will find that there is an anonymous incident reporting form that any chapter member can use if there has been any kind of issue at all in the course of PAD operations or at file the Delta events. We do have, a, like I said, anonymous, um, investigation system that our office and um, some of our leadership goes through to be able to address all of those issues as they come up. Hopefully this is something you hear about from me and you never think about it again, but we want to make sure you know it's out there for you. 
Other things to know, policies and procedures, is all of our chapter operations handbooks, like the operations guide, the model bylaws, ritual handbook, are all available to you on our website to help you set up everything you will need for the school year. Um, I highly suggest looking at the model bylaws. If your chapter does not have bylaws, it's very easy. You basically can just add your chapter information and call it a day. Again, as I mentioned before, the ritual handbook will walk you through all the steps of setting up an initiation center ceremony all the way down to providing the exact script to use. So go ahead and take advantage of that. I'll share another link with that information shortly. And then finally, we also offer insurance manual and documents. If you are holding an event off campus, venues may require a certificate of coverage and insurance. And again, your coverage as chapter officers and as a chapter as a whole is included in that $90 membership fee. So if anything like that ever comes up, just let us know. Moving on to resources for you and your members specifically, um, I want to make sure that everyone does have the link to the Law Officer Resources page, which I've sent out. I think I send that out to you guys every time I email you just to be safe, but it is pretty much a catch-all page of all of the things that you'll need. So all those handbooks are there. The materials request forms are free recruitment materials, where to request a chapter roster, where to request initiation materials, the certificates and pins all of that stuff is hosted on the law officer resources page. So that is a really important page to know if you're going to bookmark any page on our site, I suggest it be that one. Um, other resources to know about, we briefly talked about it, but we do have support for our members through our International Foundation, which is the charitable 501c3 branch of Phi Alpha Delta. So there's three critical funds I want to make sure you know about. One we already mentioned is the Inspiration Fund, which does provide funding to chapters to put on service professional networking events. So keep that in mind. If you've uh, had a lack of funding from your school or fundraising is going a bit slow, please submit a fund uh, a fund request through the inspiration fund and we will help you out however we can the second uh, fund I always like to mention is called the Mighty Sparrow Fund. It is named after uh, a member of ours who did unfortunately pass away um, during the pandemic. Um, so it's named in honor of Rodney Sparrow and that actually offers individual assistance to members who may have gone through change in circumstances. Um, they're in need of some additional financial help um, and all reasonable requests for the Mighty Sparrow Fund are considered. So that is a great option for individuals who may come to you and ask if PAD has any opportunities for financial assistance, that's a big one. Um, the other thing to know about through our foundation is our events grants. Um, we offer grants for chapter attendance at convention and at uh, the mock trial competition. So we do everything we can to help you guys out in attending those events wherever possible. You're going to hear a lot about convention grants as it, we ramp up to the 2024 convention. And I believe the grant application period for upcoming mock trial will open in October around the same time as registration. So keep an eye out for that. Um, another great thing to know uh, when it comes to financial support is one of our Phi Alpha Delta partners, Access Lex, which offers financial counseling, has an incredible scholarship database, and they have shared that with us to share with membership. So if you are looking for law, chat, law uh, school scholarships and you want the link to that um, database, please let me know. I am more than happy to send it to you. It is included on our member benefits page already. Um, we've already also briefly talked about the PAD YouTube channel, which has recordings of speaker series and other webinars that you guys are welcome to use, whether it's for personal use, whether it's to find speaking ideas, whether it's to use it as a chapter event itself, that's all available free for you. Um, another great resource is the Phi Alpha Delta Career Center, uh, which I always want to mention because it feels like that's one of our little known member benefits, um, but it has a great listing of jobs and internships. It offers uh, things like free resume review services all through that career center. So I always want to make sure that everyone has that information as well. Um, you do need to be logged in to access it. So I'm not sure if the link will work directly that I sent through Zoom. Um, but if it doesn't, you can get that from our homepage. That career center um, link is directly on our homepage there. Um, our directory is also linked on our homepage, so another great way to get member contact information, so don't discount that either. 
and we've kind of already gone through the materials requests there. Those are all on the law officer resources page there. I know I just said a lot and linked a lot of links. <laughs> so does anyone have any questions about resources, places to find things before we move on to our questions? Yeah, I would like to know about how long does it take for the recruitment materials to be sent? Like how yeah. or how um how long in it or how early in advance should we request that we're having an event? I mean, next week and we ran out of materials that we were sent over the summer so quickly at an organization fair. So um I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a great question. To be honest, the answer will sometimes depend on how busy we are. Um, right now, I think the turnaround for getting those materials out is about a week and a half. Um, so that's for um, the recruitment materials. Uh, what we usually do is we'll have pre-made boxes, and as the as the requests come in, we you know put the label on and we get them out as soon as we can. Um, if there's going to be a delay out of the ordinary, you know, more than five to seven business days, which is roughly a week and a half of calendar time will always let you know so that you can plan ahead for that um when it comes will, oh sorry go ahead um how will we know if the uh when it's when it has been sent so anything sent through our shipping system um a confirmation email is usually sent um it'll come from probably our info at pad or from our quadient system i can check on the exact phrasing of what it looks like um but we anytime we receive a, a materials request form you know that's one of the reasons we ask for your email so that way when the package enters our system you get an email with the shipping information and you can track the package as it comes okay yeah, just make sure to double check your spam folder for those because sometimes they it doesn't look like the rest of our emails since it's through our professional like shipping system so just make sure that it you know you don't expect it to come from me for example <laughs> so thank you um, and then Katie in the membership department always says that for initiation materials, a good rule of thumb is at least two weeks out um, if you need them by a certain date. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's not required that you have the initiation materials to hold your ceremony. You can always give them out later if you need to. Um, but I would even venture a little farther and, you know, say, two and a half, three weeks out, just because I know that, you know, when especially in the fall, having to ship out a hundred chapters materials at once takes a really long time because we do all of our certificate printing and assembly in-house that's not an outside thing that is one of the things that we do pretty much consistently throughout <laughs> throughout the year so uh, jessica good question faculty membership do faculty members count toward membership numbers yes they do even though they are free to join we still count those toward your initiation numbers so that is a great way to boost your numbers if you would like to do so without a lot of work from you okay Let's see here. i have one more question um <laughs> I remember seeing something in the ritual manual about alumni and being there for the initiation mm -hmm. and something about the alumni being initiated at um, that one. Can you go into details about what exactly that means? Absolutely. Yes. So, um, Oh, thank you, Jen. Jen just put in the uh, chat about what the shipping looks like. Thank you. I never remember what it looks like. <laughs> All right. So, Jessica, back to your question. Um, so you kind of had two separate questions there. I'll address the first part first. One, there is a section in the law chapter ritual that has an alumni member participation in it. And that is if you have an alumni member who is serving as a representative of, of your chapter's alumni, they can come and be a part of that ceremony. Um, that sometimes chapters choose to implement that, sometimes they don't. I always think it's a great idea to invite alumni, your district justice to your ceremonies, and they can serve in that role. If you don't have an alumni member present, you do not have to have that part. It is just a very small section of the ritual and you can skip it if you need to. Um, but yeah, as Jen said, please invite alumni and DJs. They want to be there. They volunteer for this organization for a reason and it's because they love it. So um, the second part of your question, Jessica, regarding the alumni initiation, you can actually initiate, um, you know, people who have already graduated 
into membership in Phi Alpha Delta if they didn't join on their own in law school or with an alumni chapter. Um, so for example, say I'm two years out of law school, for some reason I never found out about CAD while I was at your school, your uh, Griffith chapter, I think, right, Jessica? So, and then we run into each other at a networking event and you're like, oh yeah, I'm the chapter justice for Griffith chapter. Were you a part of CAD while you were in school? And I can say no, but I'd be interested in being a part of it practicing attorneys, people who've gone to law school, passed the bar exam, they can still join your chapter. So that's that section of the ritual that's separate. It's not the alumni member part of the student initiation. It's actually listed as a completely separate section where you can initiate alumni members into your chapter as well. In that section, um, I think there's also the information on initiating faculty because there's a little extra blurb for them and for honorary membership, which is actually our highest honor for membership. Um, I, the example I always give is that uh, the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg was an honorary member of Phi Alpha Delta. So it's that kind of level of, uh, I think the requirement is at least a statewide distinction. So that's the difference with that there. Do, uh, does that answer your question? I'm hoping yes. Okay, great. <laughs> yes, perfect. Okay. Um, so a couple of the specific questions that we got in advance um, were one was about alumni relationships and it was how can alumni relationships be fostered when there is not a local alumni chapter. My response to that is to cultivate virtual relationships. I know they are not the same as in person, but they are an incredible opportunity for you to connect with alumni that are not in your area. Um, and again, we are happy to help make those connections for you. There's a couple alumni chapters who do virtual events that are open to everyone. We can let you know about that. Um, there are people who are willing to speak to your chapter virtually. We can help you with that as well. Um, the other option is if there's not a lot of Phi Alpha Delta alumni in your area, but your school happens to keep pretty good records, you can connect with chapter with, uh, I'm sorry, with school alumni who are not necessarily members of PAD. This is an excellent tie in to what I just told uh, explained with Jessica's question about the fact that you can initiate those people into Phi Alpha Delta as alumni if you want. Um, so that's really exciting too. Um, the other great way to cultivate a relationship with alumni outside of your local area is to participate in our national events like mock trial and convention, because that is when you will meet people from all across the country, and you can actually bring those connections home, continue to work with those alumni. So those are the three biggest piece of, pieces of advice I have in terms of cultivating alumni relationships. The next big question that we got um, was a little one-on-one, little 101, excuse me, on best practices for chapter finances. Um, we do, as I mentioned prior, we have a financial policy in the fraternity policy manual. I always suggest that chapter officers take a look at that um, and make sure that they understand what the policy is. But in terms of the basics for managing chapter finances, one, I always suggest you figure out how much money is available to you, whether it's from the school, um, whether it's chapter fundraising, whether there's an existing bank account, and you set a budget. If you are starting from zero, be realistic about what events you can you can do for that semester and, and you know, just make sure you stay organized, write down what you would like to spend on things, figure out where your income streams are coming from, whether it's local chapter dues or fundraising events, requesting donations from alumni, set goals for that fundraising so that you know what to expect and then realistically what you can spend money on in the future. Set priorities. So if you don't meet those goals, you can say, all right, we are going to make sure that we have these materials for our initiation, but we're going to cancel, say, the pizza social that's scheduled for the end of the semester. Obviously a very basic idea, event idea there. Um, I, again, organization is key with finances. The chapter justice and the chapter treasurer should be the two people with um, actual signing control over any kind of chapter account. It should never just be one person. It should always be two people. Um, that's very, very important for organizational accounts. Um, I do suggest that you avoid Venmo or Cash App when possible. I know people like those because they are easy. But the problem with Venmo, a cash app, PayPal, is that they are not organizational accounts. One person needs to set up an account. So for example, if I set up an account for my chapter, it would be under my name, not the chapter's name. 
this can be a problem for individuals because if you are really, really good at fundraising as a chapter and there is a ton of money coming into your Venmo account, you can get flagged by the IRS. I know that sounds insane, but we know it has happened in other organizations. So you never, ever, ever want to be an individual holding onto an organization's money like that because it can have personal repercussions for you down the line. We always suggest a chapter bank account. We have uh, EIN, TIN, you know, those are interchangeable ID numbers from the IRS set up for every single chapter. We will share those with you if you need help setting up an account. Um, and we will walk you through that process because it is always different based on every bank in every state. So get in touch with me if you want to do that. But please, please try to avoid th those kind of uh, systems if you can. And if you really cannot avoid it, set it up so that any money that goes in there is immediately transferred to an outside chapter-based account, not an individual name account. That's really critical. The final piece of advice when it comes to managing chapter finances is to not only check file Alpha Delta's financial policy, but also check your school's financial policy. Um, many law schools have very specific policies on financial management for chapters. They may or may not allow you to open up certain accounts. They may have very specific account um, organizations you can work with, things like that. So please always check with them because I would not want any of you to have um, any kind of mark on your record because you unintentionally did not know a policy with finances going into it. So that's that's the big one there. <laughs> um, See, one of the other questions that came in was regarding uh, sharing documents, like are there preferred options for creating and maintaining an online database for sharing or accessing chapter documents, things like outlines for prior students? Um, the short answer is no, we don't have a preferred method for it. But I mentioned, you know, Google Drive, iCloud, Discord servers, Twin, um, where it's hosted doesn't matter as much as keeping the passwords to those things organized so that anyone can access it down the line and it gets appropriately passed on to the next group of officers. Um, chapter materials, uh, we've kind of went over that. Imani's questions actually hit on most of my bullet points in terms of requesting recruitment materials um, and initiation materials. I did share the link to some of our virtual items, and then we do offer paper recruitment materials as well, things like brochures and flyers from our member benefit partners. Uh, we went over, you know, where to get the ritual items already, um, and then initiation materials, or that's the stuff you can request for free from the membership department, that's the membership certificate and pins. So all of those request forms are on the uh, Law Officer Resources page. Um, and then one of the last questions that was submitted in advance was regarding increasing networking or professional opportunities. And this one was actually a very specific question. It was how can Phi Alpha Delta provide more networking, volunteer, and internship opportunities um, in this person's particular state? And my biggest advice was to use the Phi Alpha Delta Career Center for that because it does cover every single state. It does allow for um, things to be sorted by state and you can see what's available in your area. We will always do our best to share opportunities that organizations or members bring to us. Um, I know, for example, there's a, a, one of the LA County um, courts has always let us know about their internship program and we'll try to email out about that when we can. Um, but please use the Career Center first, make those connections with alumni and a lot of that stuff will then happen naturally as a result of that. Right. Okay, um, I know we are reaching at the end of our time. I am not in any rush to get off of this Zoom, so I'm more than happy to stay and answer more questions. I see one from Jessica. Do you think it's better to talk to faculty who are attorneys about joining through a faculty membership or an alumni membership? That is an excellent question. Um, one is not inherently better than the other in my mind. They are separate categories of membership. Um, I think that alumni membership does have a little bit of an extra um, like they'll receive different communications about our events. Um, they will, you know, have opportunities for more participation in terms of volunteer opportunities outside of school. So it really depends on the individual person. Um, a lot you, you need to kind of have an honest conversation with them too. Would they rather pay for alumni membership, which again, it's a one-time fee for lifetime membership and it comes with some extra stuff, but 
Do they want to pay for that membership or do they just want to be listed as a faculty member, which is free, which may have a little bit more limited engagement with um, the overall pad uh, membership as a whole. So very, very individualized. And yes, they can transfer from faculty to alumni later on if they want. We offer transition programs for th pretty much all of our membership options. You know, we have the pre-law to law. We've got law chapter to law chapter. Um, you guys, when you all graduate, you'll be contacted about joining an alumni chapter. We have an auxiliary membership. They can join at, at any time too. So yeah, we will always be happy to transition anyone's membership um, as long as they meet the membership qualifications. So that'll be fine. Just reach out to our membership department. Right now that's Katie Gibbs um, and we'll help you get where you need to be with that. So. Any other questions? It does not have to be about anything we've talked about. Anything is fair game here. <laughs> Um, hi, Emily. I just wanted to say thank you. This was very informative. I know you said that the recording would probably be available by the end of next week, mm -hmm. um, but is there any way that we can access this PowerPoint sooner than that time? Yeah, sure. Um, I will actually send out this PowerPoint um, to anyone who registered. I'll try to make sure I do that at the end of the day today um, okay. so that you guys all have it. Um, and I can have it available and request for anyone else who maybe they didn't sign up, they missed it. Um, but let me make a note and I'll do that today. Thanks, Brittany. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, you'll find we're, we're very happy to share our stuff. We, we don't believe in reinventing the wheel. We are always happy to send things out to you when we are able to. Um, that's kind of our philosophy here in the office. So yeah, I'll send the PowerPoint to everyone who registered. And then yeah, hopefully recording by end of week. So sometimes it just takes us a little bit of time to get all that stuff processed. So. All right. I'm going to go ahead and then stop the recording for this session since we're at the top of the hour, but I will stay on for another minute or two if anyone has other questions. <laughs> 